make them best with that. That's interesting. That's what. Father, do you think there's more than a coincidence that they use the acronym GOAT for uh, the greatest of all time? Oh, no. I mean, I think that was just them being like smart alecky, you know, G-O-A-T. Like there's another one, uh, like now you see LOL, laughing out loud, L-O-M-L, love of my life. Like we can't even say words now, now it's an acronym. Um, no, I mean like using uh, uh, the uh, goat as a symbol for you know as far as when you get into um like judgment sunday and goats and kind of um idolizing uh people on earth i don't know if that's maybe oh, too you're, deep, going, but... man, you're going into a deep one I didn't yeah think yeah about that. well think about you know the goats are if they're considered that higher up in essence even of the sheep you got to go into an attitude then uh what was what? you know a, a a sheep a sheep when it was slaughtered had more purity think about how they think like that they have more fat yeah purity especially when they're offering that the blood sacrifice now we offer a bloodless sacrifice but remember they used to bring it up to makeshift altars and offer a sacrifice ram they would do a goat or a sheep but there was things that were more prized and desire, desirable. And a sheep was that type of example. Because of their purity, because of their innocence compared to a goat, which is probably more of a wild, more attitude animal. Goats need a sinew. You know, it has less fat, so it's less tasty. You know, That's why I don't understand, like, my mom or someone makes katsiki. And I'm like, I, I you know. What? Don't get me wrong. It's good, but a lamb is a lamb. You know what I mean? When you want, well, it's fair. But my dad's village, they have a restaurant that serves nothing but goat. Really? Goat stew. I mean, it's so. What I'm implying? I guess I'm I'm more favorite partial to the lamb, but I like goat, and you you can tell the difference though. You could tell the, you know what I will compare goat and lamb with? It's like whenever, so when someone says, you know, have you ever tried steak? I would say I tried a steak. And they said, have you tried bison? Then you see a more gamey, yes. a more That's meaty like, kind of thing compared to like a, a cow or a, a or a calf, obviously, if you veal. I'll never forget the first time my mom told me what veal was. I enjoyed it, obviously. And like, you know, it's a baby. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, wow. Well, it was good. I got over pretty quickly. Um, I got o I got over pretty quickly, but um, it was pretty enjoyable. So, oh my gosh. Um, okay. All right. We are okay. We are good to go. All right. So we're gonna begin with prayer, and then we're gonna start our uh, second chapter of this book. Excellent. Okay. All together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Blessed la Puranya, Paraclito de Brahmat Salitias, O Panda Puparon, que da Panda Pliron. O fi sabros ten agathon ke zoeis marigos, el fe ke skinos on imin ke katharis on imas, o popasis ke lidos, ke sos on agathet as psikas imon. Amin. Please be seated, everyone. Um, let me fix the camera. So last week, I had uh, a few people say that because of it being a little bit farther away, they can't hear everyone as as best as they can. So that we got to figure out a other option where it's closer and they can hear. Whoever's reading, by the way, just speak up a little bit more in the uh, in the interim. And then um, we'll just go from there. Okay. So we concluded last week with our um, with our first chapter. And on the Feast of the Three Hierarchs, this next chapter, which is beginning at page 15, 
um, kind of talks about motherhood and the raising of the children. Now, in the in the footnotes on the bottom, it, it's indicated in this in this sermon writing that was published here that this is kind of a theme that piggybacks off of the sermon that he offered in the Feast of the Three Hierarchs. So we will probably hear and see some parts that are already were expressed from before. But again, you're going to kind of hear again on social ethics and especially the, the focus on motherhood of raising children. Uh, since we got it now, let's let's just get right into it. And then I know he said, said six to twelve. Uh -oh. it should be okay. All right, uh, Matthew, why don't you start the process of raising children? The process of raising children needs to begin while these are yet in their infancy, so that the spiritual faculties from their very appearance are already being directed towards what is beautiful, good, and true, and away from what is vile, shameful, and false. This age should be considered the surest foundation upon which to build a child's morale and intellectual formation. Sure. Yeah. Facilities therefore says, if we have virtuous children, we should choose their tenderest age to infuse good principles, since from childhood, as from the starting line, man races towards the arena where he will spend his life. Moreover, St. Basil declares, while the mind is still easy to mold and as pliable as wax, taking the form of what is impressed upon it, it should be exercised from the very beginning in every good discipline. Then, when reason enters in and habits of choice develop, they will take their course from the first elements learned at the beginning and from traditional forms of piety, with reason proposing that which is beneficial and habit imparting faculty and facility, facility in the right actions. Um, let's pause there. Thank you. Um, anyone have any thoughts on this? Or uh, does everyone agree with this sentiment? Is there any disagreement? What is your feeling on that? What you just said? Even our young guys too. What do you guys feel? Yeah, that was pretty straightforward. Um, what do you guys recognize with that? Does that sound right? Even from that, it naturally begins from infancy to train up. Yeah, you should teach children good virtue, good morality, so that when you're not around and they need to work off of something, they already have that implemented. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Anyone else? It sounds guess, like the uh, proverbs, right? <laughs> Yeah, train up a child and exactly. they will. Um, I forgot which proverbs that's like train up a child and they will walk not the, depart from it. Yeah, or not depart from yeah. the path of the Lord. Um, what about yourself, Nico? What were you going to say? Well, I was going to say that it kind of shows St. Basil's classical education that he received um, when he went off to school. And um, what St. Nicholas was talking about earlier was that mother was not afraid to send her sons to the. Educated by pagans. All right. <laughs> those, those, I think we all can agree that those foundations that I, I, I think something that we have to remind our parents modern day is the, 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 the great challenge that we place on ourselves is when we, when we can help form, you know, I bring it up on Sundays and sermons when everyone says to me, you know, is there anything that we can, how do we change the world? How do we bring love? How do you do all this? You know, we want to make a, I love the term, we want to make a world a better place. So the challenge is very simple in that one. It, it distinctly is a self-reflective term to make the world a better place because it has to start with me. It has to start with myself and the I of us. And that's, an, and then the best way to do that is naturally in the formation of the young. And when you look at Christ in the scriptures of his interactions with the young, and how even implies to the disciples and to those around them, both scribes and Pharisees, and these and these leaders of the synagogues and people who are following, and he's always modeling the importance of the young and their innocence and purity, as they are in essence kind of like the, the example to the gateway to heaven. That is distinctly to us modern day why we do that. And what hurts me, as just speaking openly as a priest, is that modern day we remove the innocence of children younger and younger and younger. I mean, what am I implying by innocence? Uh, indoctrinating them with, um, with violence, indoctrinating them with attitudes of hate, uh, who to like and who not to like, um, what they respond and recognize from their parents, what they see from their society and those around them. 
I mean, so much so that my children, gosh, I think of my own always, when I see an eight and five-year-old and they're playing any type of video game or any type of uh, electronic, whether it's from Minecraft to this and that, it still has some sort of embodiment. A, first and foremost as a human is competition. The greatest of the one who's going to get the highest score, who's going to do this and that fight. And we as adults, I, I blame, I, I'm, I'm at fault of that too. And then too, when I hear my five-year-olds, you know, saying I'm going to kill you or I'll kill you, you know, he might be talking to somebody he's playing with, even if it's like a Mario Kart, you know, I knocked them off the course. It sounds comedic, wholesome. The problem though is there's degrees of severity and also us as parents adding guidelines. You know, I always put the, 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 the metaphor as it's a road. And if you don't put it on that for them, how do you think they're just going to stay on when they don't know? They're the ones who also, it's a process that they're trying to learn how to walk and drive, so to say. Well, if you don't have guidelines and posts of warning, right? How will they ever differentiate and know? That's why it's more important now than even so that we said this before for parents that, to embody these attitudes of, of Christian ethos and as a good human being. Because if not, all these terminologies we brought up for changing society, ethical solutions, injustice, uh, inhumane, stuff like that. Well, who's it going to start with? And that's how it has to start with us. It has to start with our children. Seeing it, recognizing it, understanding. But well, I brought it up yesterday, today's Wednesday, two days ago with uh, with my youth ministries when you asked the kids, very simply, but true, like, what is love? You know, they have to understand that love is not just a feeling and emotion, but God is love. So if I can recognize that God is love, how do I apply God's God's love to my life so that I can express his love? And I know this sounds very theological, but it's true, because then when the children recognize that, they can understand that God's love is an attitude of mercy, compassion, empathy, um, wholesomeness, uh, respect, mutual admiration, service, right, to each other, all of these things. Now, naturally, these are high, high thinking levels for children, so you should go through action. If I serve, they're going to see that, oh, look, it's common for us to serve. If I help people, I should be trying to help people. It, manners. God, my favorite one's manners. If, if children, if children don't know manners, who's teaching them the manners? Do you understand? Like it's, it's a, almost a systematic thing. It's A to B, but sadly, in instances, we we don't recognize that, and then that's why we forget that this starts from infancy, even from my child. It's a year and a half, twenty of our children, or whatever. If we want to train them up right, you have to show them the guidance and open order on how to be, you know, good practicing. Christians, human beings. That's the reality. So let's continue. Who would not confess? Louis, why don't you go? Um, who would not confess that those impressions received during childhood were ultimately proved permanent? Who can doubt that these influences received during the early years are impressed so strongly on a child's simple soul that they remain active throughout the whole of their life? Nature has appointed parents, especially mothers. To be the teachers of this age. And these latter are therefore necessary to our lofty work as pedagogues to uh, suitably educate and carefully form children. Uh, it is they who serve as images and patterns of which their children become copies and continuation. A child indicates either the virtues or the shortcomings of his mother, her voice and manner, her ethos and behavior. To such an extent that one might very rightly compare him to the recording uh, to the recording cylinder of a phonograph, which first receives the waves of the voice and then plays it back in the same tone and timbre with which it was originally expressed. Mm -hmm. The mother, the mother's every breath, every word, every movement and action becomes a breath, word, expression, movement, and action of the child. Um, Asterio thus says, for one of the children preserves the tones of the mother's voice, another possesses most of her features, another is like her in disposition. The mother, through consistent interaction with the child and constant prompting offered uh, by these occasions, creates an impression in the soul of the child, influences its ethos, and gives it the initial push toward the good. With the look, a kiss, a soothing voice, and sweet words, a mother is able to rouse an inclination for the good in a child's heart. Similarly, with the look of displeasure, a tear falling down her cheek by the same expression showing the sorrow of her heart, 
She's, she is able to pull the child away from the heart destroying danger. A child raises in the mother's uh, bosom and warmed in the mother's embrace, begins to love before it has ever learned what love means. It begins mm -hmm. to subject its will to the moral law before it has learned what moral law means. It is the mother who uh, most properly plants the first idea of God in the child's heart. Basil the Great said this, this very thing. The teachings about God, which I have received as a boy from, the blessed, from my blessed mother, I have ever held with increased conviction. On my coming to ripe years of uh, to the right to right years of reason, I do not shift my opinion from one to another, but carry out the principles delivered to me. The greatest contemporary pedagogues, Pestalozzi, the greatest of contemporary pedagogues, Pestalozzi, sets total responsibility for a child's religious formation on mothers, explaining the following: I have faith in my mother and her heart, uh, and her heart led me to God. My God is the God of my mother. The God of my heart is the God of my mother's heart. Mother, mother, you fed me to God by your dictates. I found him in my obedience. Mother, mother, if I forget God, I forget you. Mm, excellent. I actually, that, that last paragraph really leaves an imprint. How many, how many people do you think, and I think this really strikes a chord, um, that the mom is the we get it. Many moms are the the catalyst for faith. Look at the look at marriages, for instance. Most most marriages um, in the Orthodox Church now are mixed marriages, right? Mixed marriages means um, different types of denominations of Christianity, uh, but the dominance is if the woman is Greek Orthodox, she will inherently get married to the Orthodox Church. So it's pulling toward the woman, and then many instances where I even baptize children of uh, either married couples or unmarried couples or whatever it might be there is a push from whom to baptize the child yeah the mother the yaya right you need to baptize that kid begin a daughter like this go now and stuff like that and you think about that one it's a very strong it's a vindication because in most instances we have a stronger guilt about our lives associated with our mothers than we do with our fathers and most especially males because obviously we're it is. We are, you know, they call us mama's boys. We're more in touch with our moms. We have that feeling and, and those indications. Women, and with their moms as well, too, they have a very beautiful relationship, whether it's, <clears throat> it could be very sisterly-like, or it could be like, not only a friendship, especially as they grow older, because you are you are going through situations that your own mother maybe went through. And that could be in instances both of giving birth, both of marriage as a, as a wife, as a mom, as a sister, as a friend, and then obviously with the traditions going on and taking on the new roles in life, that would be as a yaya and other things. So that's why when you see these attitudes about the strength of the role of the mother, you know, it can't be diminished. And that's very, that's very tough because how many of us now, when we're in a world where we have encouraged, um, not encouraged, well, I don't know, what, what word do you want to use there? where it's now commonplace that most women are working, even after post having children. Um, I'm not implying that you know women need to stay home, but how important is that role of the foundational aspect of the mom in the family? That's why if you look at family, single head families, where there's no there's not two parents, most likely, and you can just see it from just studies, whatever, that the ones that are dominated by a, a mother compared to a father in the same context of having like two children, whatever, usually the moms end up having stronger roles and stronger examples into their families than compared to the father being by himself with the children that way. It, it's it's profound when you look into these, these psychological studies, when you see what's been going on for 20, 30, 40, even 50 years. But this is a reality that we're now witnessing and seeing how does it apply to us when here St. Nicodius was talking about it, you know, nearly 130 years ago in 1895. And I, 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 you can't deny it. I mean, because when we look into it, even to our own modern day, it is what has brought us to this level. Many of us, it's that support of our moms. Um, my gosh, I, te I tease all the time. You know, when you look at our own hierarchy, look at Metropolitan Nathaniel. He has his, he's very devoted with his mother. His mother lives with him. I mean, they are that, they are that strong force. They are that united force. I think they're also not only the source of strength, they're also the source of calm, right? 
It's that balance. A mother figure brings balance into a life. Whether we stray on one way, you know, and I, I spoke about this, you know, not to speak intimately, but I know about my family here as well, too. I was talking with my father-in-law last night and, um, you know, whatever, he's expressing any issues that he's got or whatever. But like, as he said, he's like, you know, I don't, I can't come home to my wife, obviously my mother was past, to vent so that I can receive a, a sensation to calm me down, right? It's just, it goes and there's nothing to calm. Where a wife, a mother, uh, a daughter, uh, anything into that manner does that to us and for us, and not just for us, but for everyone, and then also for themselves. How do they find that balance and everything else to model and exemplify this? And that's why when we think about these roles, these achievements that mothers have, and now into a modern modern mother, who she's also a part of the workforce so that they can bring the necessary funds to have a lifestyle for the family, and to still be a mother, it's 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 intense. It's quite intense. And it's it's not easy. It's It takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of support. And that's why the relationship is that much more crucial to support and strengthen more so now than ever compared to the defined roles that we had for centuries, right? Husband was the, you know, breadwinner going out and doing what they had to do for work, whether it was tending to the fields or something like that. And the woman was the, was the foundation. It was the fortress, right? We knew when they came back that it was, there was something really funny, by the way, and I leave out this one so we move forward. Someone posted on social media yesterday, what was yesterday, Valentine's Day, and it was um, a 50s pamphlet a 50s pamphlet of what women should do in expectation of their husbands coming home from work, that there should be food ready for them, that they should put a ribbon in their hair to be prepped so when they see food. I was, a woman posted it, and she's like, is this real? I, I commented to a friend, I said, like, I sure wish it was. And they're like, oh my gosh, father. But it was just so funny, because you're reading this, it's a modern context. Oh, it sounds so far-fetched. It's like, you know, uh, everything. Um, it said, like, for the first five to ten minutes, allow the man to decompress before speaking to them. Allow them to kind of get to... It was very... <laughs> it was very funny. I was like, oh, my. If I... If we were to do this, not only would I probably be thrown back in my face, probably, like, spat in my face. And stuff, but it was just so funny to see the levels and to the situations of what is expected, what is understood, the importance of what we're hearing from Nicodius himself, and now implying, obviously, the beauty of Basil. But I, I, again, leaving it to other contemporaries. Look at this one. Talking about Pestalozzi. Pestalozzi was a Swiss educational reformer. Isn't it profound that a hierarch of the Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox Church then, which now was, he was in Rosarios already, teaching this in Athens, bringing up a Swiss educational reformer. If I were to bring up a modern reformer into one of my sermons so i'm saying oh god this guy is either far off his hinge or it's not scriptural or it's not basis and it's all these different things but he brought this up and he was applying it to his his uh not expression his vindication about what he's implying about the role of the mother and this is very powerful look mother mother you led me to god by your dictates and i found him in my obedience right a mom dictates to us and if you're obedient to her you listen and the other one says, if I forget God, I forget you. That's powerful. That's powerful. Where it means if I leave, that's like the prodigal son. When I leave, I'm not, not if I'm only leaving God, but then I leave you. And that really is what stings because we obviously recognize our relationship with our mother and the national God. All right, let's continue. Um, Nico, why don't you go? Just as a mother's good disposition. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Nick. Just as a mother's good disposition, good actions, and good deeds represent cornerstone of the child's subsequent good disposition, uh, actions, words, so her bad disposition, actions, and words, so the destructive seed of the child's subsequent bad dispositions, uh, actions, and words. As a mother is, so the child will be. If the mother's soul is ugly, unkept, black, corrupted, hardened, and rough, if her inclinations are evil, her ways scandalous and irregular, if she descends into impiety, rage, or greedy passions, hatred, then the shoots of these unseemly vices, uh, unseemly vices, will quickly spring up in the child. Conversely, if the mother's soul is godly, pure, radiant, innocent, full of fear of God, if her inclinations are kind and holy, her disposition peaceful, pious, philanthropic, and this child's goal, the right as an immediate 
Oh, all right, excellent. Greg, why don't you continue by means? Okay. By means of the influence they exercise, mothers are able to shape their children according to a particular character, so just as a potter is able to shape clay into a particular form. Of the malleability of children, Iones says the following, educating children is similar to potter sculpting because children or because teachers take clay that is tender and shape it and decorate it how they wish. But once it has been fired, it cannot be shaped any longer. This is the way it is for those who were not educated when they were children. Once they are grown, they have been hardened against change. Oh, moreover, sorry, moreover, uh, moreover, Plutarch declared in his work on the raising of children, the very souls of children readily receive the impressions of those things dropped into them while they are yet soft. Therefore, it is during the impressionable years of ch childhood that the mother may most strongly and effectively influence the child's soul, mindset, senses, mind, imagination, and morals. Once he passes out of this age, his heart hardens and reformation becomes difficult, if not impossible. Thus, the Holy Chrysostom declares, you should have anticipated these faults from the beginning. And while the child was yet docile and very young, you should have him bridled him with strictness, accustomed him to the performance of duties, brought him to order, arrested the diseases of his souls. You should have rooted out the thorns then when the work was easier, when being of a more tender age, they could have been pulled out more easily and the passions would not have been so hard to work with as after they had been neglected and given chance to grow. This is why the scripture says, one must bow their neck from their youth, for thus they may, for thus may the upbringing of children proceed more easily. Mm, excellent, very good. Any um, any thoughts on those uh, key points that we've just heard? Both from Chrysostom, from the Yanis, and everything else he's expressed. I like that one from the, uh, obviously what Henry and Campan said. Um, <laughs> She was a lady in waiting to Marie Antoinette and later had mistress of a secondary school in Napoleon's new system. Mothers. Then said the great man, raise up such women that is that this great national aim might be fulfilled. That's pretty powerful. You know, it's to me, when I think about historical context, this almost sounds so foreign because all we've heard, especially from Unless we're only thinking modern, unless we're thinking only like, no, not even modern, local, you know, the United States, because when you're thinking of 19th century, you're talking about leading up to uh, Civil War and then post, and then even before the 20th century, um, you know, we know the suffrage of women obviously get equal rights. To think that there were people who would think so highly of, of naturally of women, or especially the role of mothers, uh, what what do you think has really opened up our opened up our thoughts and minds, at least for yourselves in, the, in these kind of contexts? For me, it's kind of unique because, like, I know, like Jim was here and Andrea, when you point out this, is like you know that he sounds like he was a a trailblazer in this kind of thought set. But you know, could it be in the attitudes that, especially with the women's suffrage and for equal rights and for voting rights, that they still felt that the the soul, if it was only determined the sole role of a woman was the mother, that they felt torn down, you know, or held down. What 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 is your expressions? I don't know. Even Marita, anyone else, even online, Dimitra, if you want to chime in, let us know. What are your feelings on this kind of thoughts and discussion? What would you say? Um, Hold on. No, oh, oh, God. Um, I would say it's a, it's a hard balance, I guess, because you know, like you said like an hour working and you have to contribute to a household. It's not like that day where you get by for one in a household. 
that he's built the Bale's family along with his dad. Mm -hmm. And we read in studies children that are not held from a young age and they don't have that mother figure in their life, they fail to thrive significantly. And it carries on later in their life too. It's it's just a hard balance to strike that even if you don't have children, you're just keeping your house together, sure. keeping your whatever your family unit is together. It's a lot of pressure and it can be. Very true. Dimitra, are you on with us? Solis? Uh, any thought? Any thoughts on this discussion? I'd like to hear from you too. Uh, no, I, I, no. When it says here that bring it, start them out at a more tender age when they're younger, then they'll learn better, or they'll hear. And uh, how do I say this? They, they'll understand it better, or it'll, you, you put it into their head what's right, what's wrong. I get all that, and I, I know this is always on the mother to do this. My concern is as they get older and maybe the mother isn't around as much as, as the young lady just said, what happens then? Who has to keep telling them and reminding them, this is what you should do. This is how you should do it. Uh, I think it's a, it's a constant battle. I think it's a constant reminder of and supporting them with this so that they don't forget, so that it stays with them. Well, that's an excellent point. What I actually, let's try and let's jump on that one. Why do you think uh, we we need these constant reminders, whether it's from our mothers or from anything about how to stay on that focus, even into adulthood? Do you think it was easier in the past? Yes. Some say yes. Sure. Yeah, why Chris, why do you think it was easier? Well, you take, for example, take the, take the 18th century. They go west, cowboys, all that stuff. They tried to survive. They were trying to find a place to live. Mm -hmm. They were going, it took them months to go to I mean, they went to horse and buggies and that. And they didn't have a mother was, if someone got sick, they didn't know what to do. Today, we, we push a button and we got everything right in front of me. We don't have, we don't have to do anything. Mm. The mother will okay. 80% 80, 80 of mothers work to 90. They have to work. I mean, the reason they have to work is they got to survive. It's not the way, but during that time, they were worried about money. They were worried about just living. Mm. What, do you, what do you do then? I mean, <coughs> how would you like to live in the 18th century? Well, I mean, on my on my opinion, and I know Dimitra kind of was charming, I would, I would almost apply that I would think 18 and 1900s would have had a simpler uh, focus for families so that the, so what the that I was saying is you didn't have to continuously remind, even into adulthood, your children about whatever you taught them from a younger age. I think because of the complexity of our lives now and the lack of prioritization on the important things that might've been important back then, that's why I'm getting 40 year olds telling me I need to baptize my kid because my mom told me. Mm -hmm. That's it's true. an honest opinion. Yeah. Where if they if this was 30, 50 years ago, it was a natural participation. You know, they knew it. They didn't have to wait till mom continuously re re reminds them. Or or then they do it out of guilt. Now we also have that part too. They get you know, we have many people who do get married in the church. And then after the fact, then they'll come up and they're like, okay, now I want to get married to the church. And I'll say, why? Well, my mom reminded me that right now I can't take communion yeah. or I can't become a Kubato or I can't be a Nunor and a I'm like, so that's guilt. I'm like, all right, I just want to do it. Do you understand? But then I tell them, and I've said to a few people, you know, if your mom wasn't around, what would you do? They're like, I don't know. I can't yeah. tell you that. If I get that off, the I don't know. That's at the church level. I know people who, if we don't have our moms to set up a dinner, or a family gathering, and then let alone the food, we would just sit there like a box of fried chicken. You know what I mean? I don't know. Who's going to cook what? I don't know. Who's going to do this? I don't know. And that's a problem that I don't know catches up very quickly. Because then you're going to have to be like, then it's like trying to like go backwards and trying to put a puzzle back together. How did Yaya make this? How did mom do this? Why did she do this? You know what I mean? All those things. And that's, I don't think it was as difficult back then because it was much more simpler. They didn't have the luxury of all the things that we have now, you know, extracurriculars, 
sports, TV, blah, 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 phone, this and that. I mean, gosh, like you said, if you want to apply going out west and the things, I mean, that's all they knew. So that's why manners were a natural, you know, and someone, I was hearing what Father Lou said on Sunday. Did you notice that when Father Lou said, it's important, that in Jewish tradition, or even then during Christ's time, it was considered informal and almost reckless to be running. If you ran somewhere, it was almost in a crazed attitude. Most people in whatever they did, walk. Walking was dignified. And you would notice that, that you hear the prodigal son like almost run away from the father, right? That he went out and splurged and did everything they did. And that was kind of unique that he defined it that way. I didn't hear that before, but then I looked into it. I say, okay, because you have to put context to the, um, you have to put context again to why Christ said or how what he said. And that's important for us too, because think about this. If we're talking about 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, you know, you think of the attitudes of debutantes and them always having these hairs and stuff like that and how they're supposed to be dressed. You know, there wasn't just these attitudes of, you know, do as you feel and whatever like that. It almost was dignified and morals were a foundation. If you didn't have that, that's when you got these uh, definitions of immoral, um, unrefined, right? And then you would find out, well, how did these people not become without any morals? How did these people become without any uh, definition? And then they'll say, maybe they didn't have a mother, they didn't have a father, they were given up for adoption, they were just left off and kind of become rambunctious, right? Look at look at the examples of, um, you know, the um, oh, what were those kids called in the 20s and 30s? Not or yeah, but um, not the Sandlot. Oh God, but what's his name? Uh, spunky, yeah, like little rascals. rascals. Those examples too, and other ones where they're rambunctious or whatever. Like, where are your parents? Where are you? Know, like stuff like that. That's the truth, though. Okay, so that's them. Now, gosh, I <laughs> we have a person who was really she told me a funny story yesterday. She was complaining. It was <laughs> she got mad at me because I was laughing too. Uh, but I was thinking like my own age. She got mad at her neighbor's kids. Because they twice they were speeding down the sh the street, and one of the times she was either walking or doing something, and she got mad. They didn't hit her, but close enough. So she decides to go to the neighbor's house, tells the father, and the entire the kids are seeing this, right? So what do they do? She goes home. All right, next day comes, she opens her blinds, and her entire house is TV. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I felt so bad. I couldn't help myself. And she's like, I know who did. And, and then she's like, you know, those kids were your parents. Well, you actually know, talked to the parent. He probably helped them. And now we, it's true. We the but, you know, it's it's look where we're at 150 years ago to where we're at now. And it shows into these attitudes. And that's why when I think of some of these contexts and conversations, I'm like, gosh, how far away are we from these or or even to the resolution or recognition of, of applying this to our day-to-day -day lives. So, yeah, these are pretty interesting things. Uh, Dimitra, do you, I know you got the books today. Do you mind uh, doing a little reading for us? You have a sure. wonderful voice. Okay. All right, start. Uh, if you could a little bit louder, too, unless that's us. Okay. Uh, accordingly, on account of their lofty calling and their importance, irrespective of their subjective particular character, mothers must receive that upbringing which benefits which befits them beginning from infancy and that upbringing which befits them is the objective formation which has in view both the mind and heart. These are the two axes around which man's intellectual and moral formation revolves. If either of the two is ignored, her formation will be incomplete and defective. While the mind and heart are organs of one single soul, different formative, different formative means and ways are required for each. Since the heart belongs to the metaphysical world on account of its sensitivity, while the mind belongs to the physical world on account of its intellect. Each, therefore, ought to be taught in its own proper truth, education being the proper truth of the mind and religion being the proper truth of the heart. We must bestow both education and religion on our young women so that they, in turn, may bestow these on their own children. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, so this... Now you see, getting into this part, the next <clears throat> two and a half paragraphs. Um, yeah, into the next two and a half paragraphs, we are going to hear about the mothers of the three hierarchs. So let's go into education and religion. Uh, Nikopritis. 
Top of 21. Education and religion are two radiant lighthouses which lead safe seafaring men across life's storm to sea and keep them safe from every shipwreck and every dangerous trial. They are the two eyes of the soul by which it sees its surroundings and is able to walk the path of truth leading to happiness and salvation without stumbling. They are the two perfecting tools by means of which wounded men prove themselves worthy of lofty origin and show themselves as being of great dignity. Only mothers formed in this manner can produce good children, good citizens, and courageous men. The mothers of all great and virtuous men stand before us as radiant examples. The mothers of the three holy hierarchs, they who were great, great before Logan and John Christopher, stand before us as radiant examples. Uh, Marita, why don't you continue? These mothers desire to educate their own children as perfectly as possible, to enlighten their minds through Greek wisdom and science. They do not shrink from sending them to pagan teachers in order that their intellect may be truly developed, giving no thought to the heterodoxy of their teachers. That is, this is because they have confidence in themselves. They have confidence that their love is pure education and their fervent zeal for religion had been wholly channeled into the hearts of their children. They knew that nothing would shake the religious principles and convictions of their sons because they have carefully built, been built upon rock. Keeping with this, Amelia and Nona, the dead and noble mothers of Basil and Gregory, Gregory, sent their sons to Athens, the home of learning and illumination, but also the center of idolatry, wherein the pagan religion was enthroned in all its grandeur. Their, convic their convictions did not prove false. Within the flame of faith burning brightly in the depths of their hearts, the two young students remained unflinching throughout their whole period of their study. They were neither shaken by the teachings of the sophists who systematically attacked Christianity, nor were they enticed by the pompous rites of pagan worship. And thus they returned to their mothers with their religious convictions virtuous and at their feet. They offered themselves to their mothers as a reward for their pedagogical labor, literary concern, and virtue. This was a rich reward indeed for the mothers who treat their sons as members of Christ, that is, as members of themselves. If one is not a member of Christ, then he is not a member of any Christian mother, because a Christian mother, being a member of Christ, cannot have a foreign member, a decaying member, a corrupted member, as a part of her. A son's wandering then is lost. But when a mother's son keeps the faith, he might rightly call this self recompense. And it never would have happened if the mothers had not been formed in a Christian man. Okay. Uh, yeah, this ties into like how we heard from his first uh, sermon, right, to the three hierarchs. Anyone want to point out anything from this one? That could have been written today. Yeah. <laughs> Let me think about it. Taking teachers. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I actually want to talk on one point about this. I remember in my in my elementary and, and junior high days, I had a teacher that um was nominated for one of those, I think it was called a golden apple. And um it was obviously I think the highest award they would uh, give to a teacher in the state of Illinois or anybody in the United States. Anyways. <laughs> She was exemplary, down down to earth, very, even motherly in her actions, but as you, you know, refined and would teach us and everything else. I, I struggle sometimes, and I think in modern day, and I, I, you look because modern situations, when we look at schooling, you know, our parents have such a fight now, especially vocalized about curriculum, right? You've heard about it, threatening and stuff like that. My attitude is, I don't know, maybe Matt, similar age as myself, um, that's that curriculum though has existed in some type of way for a long time. I don't understand why it's becoming a point now when I don't recall my parents. Now I will say humbly, and they're not online, but it doesn't matter. My parents did not have that direct involvement in my studies that maybe some parents did or maybe had less had. You know, they trusted both me, especially as I grew older. Maybe when I was younger, they would be more involved. But especially come like junior high, I would have a lot more freedom, but it's also to the entity and our family and the dynamic where I was younger, my brother and sister are much older. It is what it is. But now you get people fanning flames, you know, like, oh my gosh, they're presenting, you know, devil worship and, and teaching us about orientation, stuff like that. I'm like, okay. So my thing is, whatever is being taught to your children, how are you as the parents going to handle it? Are you, is this productive? To the growth of your child, the the fanning of the flames against counterculture, counter curriculum. Because my attitude is, 
not, uh, th are we teaching our children how to de determine right from wrong? That's the other problem too. Because I don't know if we're doing that in general, let alone at the school level. Because I had times, I remember distinctly, especially like in history class, I used to get so upset whenever they talk about the Greeks. They would still talk about the stupid gods, right? And they would tell us about ancient Greece, and that was it. And I'm like, so you're telling me from BC to anything, there was no Greece or any capacity of it. But that's how the history books said. And then you would see other points. Well, to the next, we understand even the history books have publishers. They also have writers and people looking over it, and they might add some subcontext for their own derivatives. And I think that's where the real show comes to play, that our parents, that's why I, I challenge parents now, Monday, it says, you need to be an engaged parent. I know you're tired. I know you're working. I'm super, super, I say spoiled, not even blessed, because I put a Svitera, who is a uh, teacher by trade, and she also teaches now, recognize this stuff so she can obviously be, we almost feel like we could be ahead of the game because we're, we're applying this to our children, even from the oldest, even to the baby, right? Okay. So, but I know other ones are like, it might as well be foreign to them. And then that's, that's those who are, have a natural born tendency to even recognize curriculum or even be born in the United States. What about those ones that come from out of state? What about the eight? What about Asians, Latinos, um, Indians, you name it, whatever. They don't have a, uh, a background to understand the English American ethos of what we are to modern day. So you'll get a lot of those who are even more sharper and they'll be, you know, they'll deny anything or want to express it. Or then I know, and I'm not picking on the Latinos, but other ones where their parents are just exclusively workers cannot give the time and place to guide their children to know the right and wrong, especially from curriculum and to go from there. I'm not implying that it's then, you know, subliminal messaging that's affecting our children. But then the challenge then is, where are we as parents to help guide our children to know right from wrong? And then from there to then trust so that when I go to college, you know, that's the funniest one now of college, that there, every parent's afraid for college, wherever you go, because we have now, we have defined them as, you know, liberal breeding grounds, right? Okay, you've got uh, dem democracy here, socialists here, there's a communist group at each college, you get this stuff. And yeah, you get young Republicans, you hear all this stuff, okay, yeah, yeah, this is we're all together. When are, are we, but have we taught our children to differentiate? Have we chill, taught, taught our children not to differentiate, but they have open minds in every capacity? So not to say, oh, I'm going to be a socialist today, or I'm going to be like this and that. And how to realize that this, these are also avenues or grounds for um, participation. And the word and the verbiage I want to use is, is um, it's not to be cool. Uh, what's the terminology? What I'm talking about. Um, yeah, to be cool, to be um, trendy, trendy um, to be to be a part of, to, be, to feel a part of a group instead of being excluded from a group. Well, That's always a big thing, too. You know, woke, woke, woke is an attitude of, like, you think you're with it, right? And then you're going to be like me. You're ready for me to say this. And then you're going to be like me in my mid-30s, going into my later 30s. And what when I was with it is not what I'm with now. And what, what is now I'm really afraid of, and it's going to happen to you. You know, it's, that's actually a Simpsons line. I, I take that from Grandpa Simpson. He said it to Homer. But, uh, <laughs> but, but anyways, it's true, though. It, it changes. You're, you're woke now. Five, ten years later, well, you thought you were cool and woke now. will be even weirder then or out of date by then. And But then the funny thing is it all gets regurgitated because then now – Fashion wise, you see now we're wearing bell bottles like the seventies, high waisted jeans. And I'm like, oh my god, we look so silly. I, I feel like I'm looking at like, you know, my mom and my dad when they got married, and I see young one more. And I'm like, this is. And I was like, this is hip. I'm like, we are insane. I'll use that as for our word as people, but that's for a different terminology, a different time. But um, yeah, the, the, it I, it's popularity. It's all about popularity. Feeling to be a part of the group. That you are popular. That's why, with all due respect, I was one of them. I, I joined a fraternity, right? And a fraternity, when I was in college, it's like, you know, you felt that you were part of a group of clay. And so because you're part of that, in the enormous fishbowl that is a university of thousands of people, you had some, I don't know, prowess, importance. Because if not, like, especially like UIC, where I went, that, is the, that was the in most interesting fishbowl because it's a transient university. Not many people live on campus. 
you came and went. So you could have been so transparent, no one even knew you went there. And then you go and 10 years later, you got your degree, you have a family. And I was like, oh, where'd you go to college? Uh, UIC. What? I, I can't tell you the amount of people I've met that have went to UIC. I guarantee I have absolutely no interaction or connection. I'd be a center circle or whatever it might have been. But it shows that now other schools, you, you know, there might be more interaction because you had to live there or if it's out of state. But that's a reality, especially with that popularity attitude. And I think that's an effect to us especially when we were having these attitudes, both of modern day and how to, that, so it goes back to what Dimitra said, why do we have to keep reminding our kids even when they get older? And I think it's because modern day, again, 50, 100, I'm 150 years ago, you know, they had more defined focus in their lives. Religion was still associated in their lives, right? Naturally. Sundays were still considered the day of the Lord. Um, God, if you go into times of war, it was either life or death, right? And survive food. You know, they didn't have luxuries of, you know, oh, okay, I'll still go to college and a foreign country is killing each other, but that's okay. They're far away. It doesn't affect me or balloons in the sky that, you know, are spying on me. But again, to each their own. It shows into the differences and attitudes of what happened then 150 years ago to what's happening now. That's why I do believe it's harder. And that's why what Tadimitra says, I personally believe that even to modern day, that's why it's so important that, you know, why why when I say the prodigal son story after the Sunday of um the second Sunday of the Triodium, every time we hear it, I myself, a priest now for 10 years, again I got something new and I heard it from a different priest, right? How is that possible when it's the same thing you hear every year at the exact same time? Doesn't the story doesn't change, but I'm learning something new from a point of view or a or a word or a sentence or a perception. How? I don't know. Why is it then implied for us as kids? So I think that the attitude should be is we are called to continually grow. I think modern day, once we feel that we have finished studies and we've entered a professional realm, we almost don't want to continue. We don't want to grow more. And growth, I'm talking about in an educational purposes. How many actually then study more to do well? Other than, other than studying for work to gain more money or more influence at work, how many people outside of that realm, study more in general. First of all, we see a decreased participation in general reading, right? Books are becoming obsolete. We have audio books, right? We have podcasts and we read at home if we do. That's why, as I brought up into this group, when I when I have to call my group one semester Bible study and then, to, and then I'm getting feedback from people saying that sounds outdated and I change it to a different name, yet it's the exact same thing and still there's no participation. What's the difference? I agree. So that's a big struggle too. So I think we have a rooted issue in society that continued growth and continued education is not supported or it's not encouraged. You know, what do you think? What do you tell me? It's okay. okay. I'm just thinking in terms of- Now you're biased. You're older. You are studying. Uh, no. I'm, also, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm also in the tech business. I've had to like relearn my profession every- by yeah, it changes. six years. You know, education is something that is continuous. You know, I, I would think of people in education the same thing. You know, it's, you know, you have to continuously learn. That, you know, I think it's the old days, maybe when I originally graduated from college, people would graduate from college and said, okay, my education's over. Now I'm going to go into work life. Maybe that was true in the 50s, mm. but it's not true nowadays. Sure, and that's a good point too, because right now, well, especially in the, and so the dynamic that we're in is a survival of the fittest, right? So you have to be at, at the at the the grade level that what's going on modern day. Because yeah. if you're outdated, you're outdated by they don't need yeah. you. That's a good point too. But again, that I imply out of work. I'm talking about ex, ex an external education. In other words, that's why uh, let's go let's go scriptural. Let's go to let's go to religious. If if this doesn't if this doesn't relate to me, it's not a priority. Correct. My priority is my success and my work level. So then if I'm an IT or I'm in some type of technology, knowing that it changes every two to five years, I am forced to study more in that realms so that I can succeed and be with the head of the curve. If not, I fall behind and then I lose a, a lifestyle, correct? The problem though is as spiritual Christians and growth, we have fully lost our lifestyle because we don't make an attempt to learn. Look at, look at our modern churches. I'll give you an example, modern churches. Up until high school, is there anything after high school for continued education in your faith? No. 
I have, I have 50 people graduating. That's not even, I, I say hardship, it's not even a relation. You, yes, but that's for vocation. Seminaries for vocation, future ordination for males, and then future ministry for females or anyone else that wants to go in. Continued education. Heck, we, we as churches, especially these, I'm going speaking Orthodox, especially as Orthodox, once high school ends, we actually even, for, for a few decades, we've ignored the college age. We never connected. We never united. We never encouraged saying, hey, where are you at? Um, is there a local Orthodox church? Let us con let us contact the local priest there to inform them. Hey, I have children at the University of Illinois at Champaign. X, Y, and Z, would you mind reaching out to them? Now, modern day, the last 15 years, we have what's called created Orthodox Christian Fellowship, OCF. And those are chapters at local colleges to continue just first the unity of orthodoxy, and then secondly, maybe a discussion, maybe a lecture, maybe an ethical thought process about what's just going on. How do you guys feel as college students, whatever? But then, you know, we, we, we there's a little, there's a softening there, especially as us, because, oh, they got a lot of studies. I get that often from people. They tell me, Father, they're really busy in college. I said, I know. I, I also have three kids and I have a family, so I'm busy too. It's not hard to just reach out to them. See, we, we, we coddle that. And then the problem is once they come out, right, whatever they come out and they're getting ready for the professional, or then they go to their um, second level of education, master's, doctorate, you name it or whatever, add additional three, four years. There could be a scope between one to eight years that someone doesn't step foot in church. Then what do you do? So and, and all this is just general conversation. But for one in eight years possible, a lack of church, this one that's prayer worship, and then to a lack of knowledge in faith and church, you know, our general faith, whatever you learn from your childhood might as well be out the door, right? I mean, because you don't pray, okay? They, they're not, they don't, they're not offered the opportunity to practice. They don't offer, they're not, up, they're not receiving the opportunity to, as a, as a well oiled machine to stay maintained and they go and I do it, but I will promise you, and I've seen it at our church here locally, we send in the fall care packages, but not the care packages just because of the sweets. We also send them a, a prayer book or something for them to read. And then we also send them maybe like a prayer rope and then a letter of encouragement and also just trying to stay, stay connected. And then in the spring, and so something that I try to do is that I also reach out to them, whether it's via phone or text and just say, how are you doing? How's everything going? We wish you good well in your studies. Uh, and then you ask them, are you going to be back for, for Easter? Are you going to be back for Holy Week? When do you come back so we can come so we can see you? That encouragement also showing a bridge between I and them, we to them. And I can't tell you, now this is my, I'm not put, I'm not just beginning my fifth year at St. Acadios. For As the four years as we were doing the care packages, especially last fall, and I didn't post, there was about four or five out of the 35, 40 kids that we sent care packages to who sent me pictures of like a little prayer corner they've made because of the icons they've received or of their prayer book that we have sent them and their their and there's their bubble skinny or across that they have. That's impactful. Because why? Myself at UIC, when I was in my dorm, I never prayer corner. Then you could say I had St. Basil. I, I made the attempt, but not one other Greek Orthodox kid while the St. Basil went to St. Basil when I went there. Not one from UIC. Now, mind you, as I said, it's a transient school, right? Everyone's coming in and out. They live in the north suburbs, south suburbs, fine. So it's not their home, but I did it. And that actually was very formative because then I had my home away from home. I lived in Palo Souls, which was 30 minutes away. But imagine if we have those opportunities. Not even with now. Look at our kids now. Look, look at Michigan State. We saw the devastation just happened a few nights ago and that massacre. We have one child there. I reached out to them. I reached out to the parents. How is he doing? Is he okay? Yeah, he wasn't there. He was in his apartment. Thank God. But they were barricaded, you know, until everything was clear and stuff like that. That's serious. But it's not to imply that just because we reach out that they care. But it's it's important that we know who's what and where. And that we stay connected. That's the importance that I think that I would almost challenge the the attitudes of the mothers of what they do. What What's probably the sh strongest unifying effort between moms and their children is the connection and staying connected. Phone calls, visitations, um, engagements, participations. And then from there, you kind of still continue to foster. And it, it might not be often. 
I mean, you have parents, you have people who live far away, whatever. Ah, but we have technology now. You can FaceTime, you can text, you can call. How are you doing? I miss you. How's everything? And then she might tell you, do you know today's got that other theta? Did you start fasting? Uh, no, but thanks for the reminder. Okay, I'm going to start from here. You understand? But it goes a long way. It goes a long way. And that's okay. So going back to what Dee was saying originally to that point, which I really enjoyed, is, you know, even though now we remind them or we have to remind them, I as a priest, I can't tell you. Every year when I say something, I brought up the prodigal son. When I talk about old wives' tales, yaya-isms and stuff like that, I almost have to say it. Every year I talk about ayasmo, which is the holy water. But you will still have people, as we are all conditioned, whether it's from youth, from the villages or whatever it was, that we understand in one way. But there is other things that we learn and grow to so we can understand not right from wrong, but tradition to practical. Tradition to practical. And that's important, too, for as we continue to grow. Let's just, we're almost done with this chapter. It's only a page and a half. It'll take us about 10 minutes. We can get it done. Um, let's continue from there. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Rotondo, would you like to read? Widowed in her 20s. Widowed in her 20s and having only one son, John's mother, the good and noble Anzuka, gave herself over wholly to his upbringing, showing greater concern for the raising of her son than for a second marriage. Such being the case, when her beloved and only son matured and desired further education, she did not hesitate to entrust him to a pagan teacher for the development of his spiritual faculties. Her confidence in her own faith translated into confidence in her beloved son, for she knew that she had poured everything into him. Her confidence did not prove false. Immediately following his studies and after briefly pursuing a position as runner, he gave himself over wholly to the service of the church. John's teacher, Labanios, was greatly grieved by mm -hmm. the successful hold the Christian religion maintained on John. Signifying the cause of his success, he cried, Alas, such women there are among the Christians. How truly beautiful. What radiant examples these pious mothers are for us. What impressive images, what wondrous standards. Who can deny that it is mothers who produce great and virtuous men? It is for this reason that Rousseau in his book, Emile says, men always do what women find pleasing. Hence, if you wish to become a great and virtuous, then teach women what greatness in soul and virtue are. We need to form mothers in accordance with the aforementioned examples then beginning this process during their childhood so that we might be sure of their future success. Excellent. Um, uh, Greg, why don't you finish the rest? It's about like two paragraphs. Okay. Um, we must form our daughters both religiously and intellectually so that they might live up to their calling. Highest education and muse-reared religion must coexist because these two together are the only provisions capable of sustaining man as he travels the course of his life. Mm -hmm. a, a reprehensible one-sided upbringing leads to two undesirable outcomes, either to superstition or to contempt for divine things. Mm -hmm. Such an end is the natural outcome and the immediate end of this kind of upbringing. Intellectual and religious formation are two different kinds of trees planted in the same field, which need to receive the same attention and care if they are to grow in tandem. Unequal attention and cultivation will bring about disproportionate development, the growth and dominance of one and the withering and the subjection of the other. If concern is shown for the mind alone, the decline of man's religion, religious sensitivity is inevitable. If care revolves around religion, not muse-reared religion alone, his intellectual facilities will either will wither and become dull. The consequence of the first is Consequences of the first are irreligion and atheism, from which follow innumerable evils. The consequence of the second is superstition, the fury of humanity, which sword in hand threatens with death any who believe differently. These are the consequences of one-sided education and imperfect motherly guidance. Excellent. Any uh, last thoughts on this uh, thought or chapter you want to say anything? I need to get you at the point you on. You were saying before, so I'm sorry. No, no, no. I just first of all, this is amazing stuff. I did absolutely love it. The one thing that, that always cracks me up is here's so many women. Um, I've been single all my life, and and 
we hear people say over and over again, there are no good guys out there, there are no good guys out there. My response to women all the time is, you have the most influence over the raising of children. Why did you guys raise such lousy guys? <laughs> <laughs> so, I think that'd be kind of harsh when I get a slap to the face. <laughs> but you know, I that's 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 a that's a good point too. I mean, I, I struggle with that one. Um, I know people, you know, modern day who you know, it is. It's like, you know, I can't find good guys or whatever. And it goes both ways. You can't find, and then let's say I can't find good women. I, I think the reality is these are these are now societal problems where we are creating these attitudes and and sometimes parents are losing sight about the importance of the role of the parent. And I think what hurts me is the ones who then decide to become more of a friend than a, just a typical parent. Um, you know, that's a, that's a big, that's a big struggle. And I, I, and sometimes, you know, what I've, what I've determined, what I've realized in my priesthood, and because I speak with people spiritually and speak with people privately in a psychological manner as well, too, every, you have to speak to every individual, whenever something happened, you have to figure out how did they get to the point to do what they do? Hypothetical. If a parent is treating a child like their friend, right? And then they say, I don't know what's wrong with my child, you know, X, Y, and Z and stuff like that. And they'll say, I do everything to them. I'll be like, okay. But I've always gone thinking, how were you raised? Okay, tell me. And it might be like the complete opposite. Super hard, super strict, riding them like no business and blah, 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 and stuff like that. And so then they're doing the complete opposite, right? Where then they're, then I'm, then in that attitude, you're almost expressing a lack of self-worth, saying that how you were raised was wrong and that you don't want them to turn out how you are in some manner. Because how we are is a direct, will be a direct representation to our children. I mean, it is, it's just whatever it was. How you were raised, in some manner you'll be, or because of how you're raised, you're then gonna determine how you're gonna raise your children. I have parents, you know, people like, I will never do what my mom did, I'll never do what my dad, stuff like that. And what happens most of the times we end up doing or mimicking in that same manner because that's how we recognize and stuff like, and go from there. I think, I think sadly though, uh, as a parent, this is the same thing, a lot of these are also human problems. We have to be able to be open to understanding and change if whatever the process is is not working. Hypothetical could be even for the child. What if the child does not receive dictation or guidelines and, and guidance to the way that you, exp uh, you expect them to receive it? And that could be for my well, maybe with all the respect, you might have a disability. Okay, if you have a child that's deaf, you're not gonna treat the child the exact same way that maybe that you were raised you might give them guidelines, but then now you're going to have to evolve to the evolution of what you now your child has to deal with. And that could be anything else. Something might happen to you. How are you going to then raise your child in that manner? If something has happened to you where it has affected you or affected what you do. And I think these are all food for thought that we have to uh, kind of realize and kind of um, put in the context when we apply it to our, uh, our mission, our goal as parents, and we take care of it um, in, in an appropriate manner. That's, that's how, when I think of the, when I hear some of these, these teachings and, and discussions, I, um, I really, I really think about that because in many instances, when I talk with people, I try to get to that level and they'll tell me either they were brought up a different way and don't want to have the same childhood that, that they had, or, or they will do the exact same thing. They might have a, a beautiful childhood, and then they'll want to repeat the exact same for the children. I said, yeah, but maybe your children are in a different realm. And that is the best part. I'm only speaking from a one-person perspective. What about the other one? The father or the mother, right? Vice versa. So it takes both. And I brought this up. Ooh, I don't remember when I brought this up. I was speaking with some people. It might have been Monday night, actually Monday night, with our family night that I was talking to the parents. The cohesiveness on the parents being on the same page. That means the same game plan, same efforts. It's not to say the father is rough. I'm going to go to mom because she's going to console me. Or my mom is rough on me. I'm going to go to my father to console me. That's where a lot of the bridges of, you know, a mama's boy and a daddy's girl kind of like bridges off of that way. They stay closer to their father because he's that protective figure. The mom is a softer figure who will then comfort or whatever while the dad is harder. You know, it's a, it's a crisscross. That's almost has like a natural perception, but it has to be a balance. It has to be a balance. And then for the parents, it has to be a, a synonymous understanding. If there is not, you get struggles. You get struggles. And then, then why is it a struggle? We forget. When they struggle as, in, as children, 
when they get older, do you think they're just going to naturally grow out of it? Some of them think it is PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. In other words, they've had an effect, and something's been affected to them. It could be from getting, you know, a smack on the butt to how, you know, how someone speaks to them. Gosh, I know someone, I'll not forget, it was very traumatic for them. A verbiage of a word and to the uh, intoning of it and how strong it was affected that person gravely. We almost made them like shut down because they had that as a word that their parents would use against them from childhood. Think about that. But that goes to the level of degrees of you don't even know how, what, and where something can affect someone and then in turn affect them as they get older from there. So that's when you say, you know, it's hard to find good parent, find a good husband, find a good man, and also find a good wife. It's different, you know, it's just different now. It's not, we're not in the same realm. This isn't 50, 60 years ago, you go to the local dance, you go to the local this. Um, <laughs> I chuckle when people tell me they want to come to church and find something. I said, good luck. <laughs> like, I said, you're gonna, you're either gonna find, you're gonna find people with full families already, elderly, or someone that wants to be single, like wants to be single. I don't want to be with someone or whatever. It's not what it used to be. Like, oh, I'll find a nice girl, she'll go to church. It doesn't work that way. And then if there's a girl attending church at a younger age, we'll say, let's say in college, oh, gosh, now modern day, you don't get married till what? 28, 30 plus, right? Those early ones. I I, I was teasing Penelope, our, uh, our office, uh, you know, minist- uh, director of our ministries and church operations. I had a premarital couple and they were 20, they were both 26. She said, they are so young. I said, I got married at 26. That's young. I'm like, I had my, I, we had our first child when I was 27 and a half. I would say there's still growth. I'm still growing now and I'm in my mid to late thirties, right? What's the difference? But, you know, and then I, then I said, I got defensive and I actually brought up like some family members. I said, yeah, but now when I look back on it, I was so, I'm, I obviously I am blessed and grateful. Paul, everything's just, you know, rolled out of my life. But like when we got the third one, it was now a year and a half. And I was what, 33, going up 34. It's tougher as you get older. I've heard people say that. I've heard moms. That's a problem. Ma- Dimitra, moms telling children, you know, it's tougher as you get older. Do it while you're younger. Do, 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 do. We hear it right. That's everything. Not just marriage, not just children, anything in life. But either happens or happens. I think sometimes when I talk to like what you just said on that topic about finding a good guy and finding a good girl, I don't think it's just, I don't think it's on the aspect of that the parent, and I'm not saying you just said that. Let's say, like, you know, it's the parents to blame. I think in many of these situations, what I'm finding is the opposite, is that the parents did a really nice job. Um, and I, yes, I will say that. I find a lot that the parents did a great job. And these are very well, well-to-do well professionals. They're so inundated in the professional life, they can't physically find to make time to have a uh, a relationship, relationship marriage one with what they're doing, truthfully. And worse, I'm finding well-to-do girls, 28, 30, 32, and they tell me, Father, I can't find a good guy. And then I see these well-to-do guys, and I said, what's your problem? Like, she was a beautiful girl. She's smart. She has a job. My gosh, if if this was me 20 years ago, show me the keys. Let's roll. I have no problem. (laughs) Now, now we have an attitude of, there's also, I think, and, and 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 the roles have changed, where now the guys are timid of the girls. When I say timid, it's not because of beauty. They're intimidated by how well to do they are instead of them being the breadwinner. I still think so. we still have these complexes. Oh no, I'm the breadwinner, something like that. I'm like, hey man, especially modern day, this is someone you got to think of an attitude. That's what I tell my couples. Your attitude is comp- compatibility, right? And and realizing for long longingness to grow old together. Can you see yourself with the person you're with that you can grow old with? Because when you have that, just as a big question, right? We're old. I don't know what that means. What's old? I don't know. I tell people when you get your AAP card from 55, 60 years old, I'm not old, right? Okay, fine. For discussion. But um, because then I <laughs> struggle for my ministry at St. Thaddeus, because I can't create an old group because my older people don't think they're old. <laughs> and my old one is old. So, all right, we'll just get together. But to finish on that topic, um, we that's that's the problem of what we're dealing with is that I think whatever you have a drive for is what you're gonna focus on. Church, if church is not a priority, it's a back burner. And then sadly, which was such a priority in all of our lives, what was our parents? 
gosh, so she was Greeks. What was it for Greeks, especially, especially ethnocentric Greeks? It was A, find a Greek, B, get married ASAP. I mean, even after the ad adage of 18, uh, getting out of 18 years old, you better have this figured out. But, you know, and then I'll never forget, my sister was my age. But remember, she's 13 years older than me. She got married at 26, 27. My parents considered that old. Why my mom? I was tw I was 19 when I got married. Her dad, 21. That was a lifetime ago, figuratively speaking. But that's how they constitute everything. And those are those are heavy discussions. Those are heavy topics because that's what they relate to these uh, situations. And that's how they understand. That's why you have parents say, and then we get that PTSD because then you're forcing the child to move faster. And maybe their life hasn't caught up to that level. Maybe they're not ready professionally because then we have to have that too. I have to have funds. I have to have a, a solid job, right? Before I can propose to someone that I care about and love so that I can have a life with them. Because who, who do you know will just give a ring, right? Without having a job or having funds so or whatever. What do you do? You're take out a loan to get a ring and the girl sees you. I mean, we have that answer too. You know, we always say, oh, women are in for, are in for money or stuff like that, or men are only in for beauty. Okay, but that, that, those are complexes that have been conditioned in all our minds. That's modern day now. Now the rules have reversed. It used to, I think it used to be as hard to find good girls, not good girls, just a, a, a girl you want to marry. Now the attitude is girls can't find good guys. And the guys were a plethora, right? Where the, the guy, a general guy, you know, we had the old, you know, I always use the example of like Greece, right? The movie, right? John Travolta on that. You know, you had the, the Thunderbirds, right? The, the Greasers. And then you had these other guys as well, too. But then you had the jocks and all these other things. Okay, so you had these things. But you saw the guys and the girls were, you know, it wasn't as opportunistic now it's almost role reversed there's 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 girls and now there's not guys to find to be with the girls which blows my mind because when i'm getting girls to come speak to me and say father can you find me a good greek guy i <laughs> i have like numerous and then i get mad at the greek guys because i speak very manly I'm like what's wrong with you go ask her out <laughs> what i gotta do it for you like you know what i mean like it's it's not hard that's a, these are complexes that i think they built up Plus past, past incidences that say, well, I'm not at their league. Or I don't know. Because when you tell them, that's the other problem too. A woman is well-to-do, has a job, maybe even comes from a nice family or even a wealthy family. Oh, a good man. You would think so. That's intimidating to them. Because I think, you know, I think it is, I think it's pressure. I don't think they can, they'll, they'll feel that they're not going to meet the expectations that are demanded of them. That's, that's an implication too. All right, we're going to finish up, everyone. Thank you for a very nice and lively discussion tonight. Next week, we're going to go to the next chapter, which is a, a really nice one about, um, about the youth and his sermon on the uh, Feast of the Holy uh, Archangels, the CNX Feast of the Archangels in November. And then we're going to stop there. We'll finish that one next week. And then we will reconvene after Pascha, this same book, and finish the last couple chapters. I do encourage all of you, while those are online, and I want anyone who watches our our, our our videos later on beginning with the first Wednesday of Lent, March 1st, we are going to have six Lenten lectures. That means every Wednesday during Lent. And we are having we six are different presenters. The best part of them, it is not me or Father Christopher Bullis. Um, <laughs> the presenters, uh, we're actually going to post out on Friday who they are. We actually have a really beautiful and diverse group. Uh, the first week is uh, Deacon Theodore Sacolaridis, who is a, who is a, I believe, not a neurosurgeon. He is a surgeon, um, uh, I think of proctology, if I remember correct. And he uh, he's out of the University of Chicago and Rush. And he is the, he is the deacon at St. Peter and Paul in Glenview, Illinois. Mm -hmm. So he's going to speak to us regarding um, the, uh, the, the importance of the body as an Orthodox Christian. Okay. Um, the following week is March 8th. We have Father Jim Gordon who is a retired priest who used to serve the community of Ascension in Lincolnshire, and he'll be speaking started. to us. What? He started. Yeah, he pretty much started the church. Yeah, we're talking about now 25 years ago. Unbelievable. He'll be speaking to us uh, about the understanding of Lent and how we can uh, kind of calm ourselves to uh, allow Christ to be and uh, live up with us. The third Wednesday, which is this uh, March 15th, is... Mr. Nick Kazmiotis. Mr. Nick Kazmiotis is the, uh, I think he is one of the, um, he works for IOCC, which is Interna International Orthodox Christian Charities. 
and he also leads the local metropolis jurisdiction uh, from that. IOCC is especially involved like with devastations and uh, natural disasters like what just happened in Syria and Turkey. Uh, they go out and give funds, they go out and help uh, procure uh, food, um, items for sustenance and to support the people who are, are su and suffering. And he's gonna speak to us. He also was a former priest. Um, so he's gonna give us some of that wisdom from there. Um, after that, we have Dr. Rhonda Anderson. Rhonda Anderson, uh, she with other Orthodox psychologists run the National Bureau of Orthodox Christian Psychologists throughout the United States. They have this huge directory and she is going to speak to us regarding the understanding of our of our spiritual being during Great and Holy Lent. Uh, she has a really great um, uh, plethora of knowledge, especially from the psychological manner as an Orthodox Christian. And she also works with Dr. Ari Christophides locally here in Park Ridge and in uh, Northern Illinois. So she's going to be a great asset to want to listen to. And then the, uh, four, the fifth one will be Archdeacon Vasilio Smith. He'll be talking about the role of the deacon in the Orthodox Church. And then the last uh, last Wednesday will be with uh, Dr. Helen Theodoropoulos, who will speak to us more about the role of the women in the Orthodox Church. So we have a really nice uh, uh, schedule for London lectures. I really hope we're going to get some uh, new faces that want to come see. We usually get about the same 30, 40 people who come for the services. We have a beautiful meal offered. Um, we're talking with our parish council to have... Um, uh, our ministries to offer the meal to the various ones. So they're going to be rotating in that. And then um, we'll kind of go from there. But I'm, look, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm excited. It's great to bring in new faces and different, not point of views, but just even different voices, even about the same topics, because it also gives us an opportunity to want to be more attentive. I don't find that everyone's tired of me. I'm tired of myself. Um, and then from there, uh, to gain more in their knowledge and, and their understanding about our relationship with God and with each other. So uh, it's gonna be a beautiful time. So I hope everyone will be able to join us uh, during Lent, very simply, every Monday and every Wednesday for the six weeks of Lent, we will have great compline on Monday nights beginning at 5.30. They're predominantly reader services. So please bring your books as I'll encourage people to come up to the channel stand and just read. They're all predominantly in English. Um, the Wednesday nights are the pre-sanctified beginning with ninth hour at 5.30. And then Friday nights for the first five Fridays, we chant the Hedetis Me, the salutation services. They're broken up to four stanzas. And on the fifth night is the salutations. The only curveball this year is that March 24th, it is the Vespers for the Annunciation. It falls on a Friday. So it'll be Vespers. And then before the dismissal of Nina Polis, we will then chant the stanza to the Theodokos um, for the uh, Feast of the Annunciation, the fourth stanza. And then from there, uh, finish the, the beauty of the great vespers uh, for the Feast of the Annunciation to the Holy Ghost. It's a unique, it's a unique uh, rubric that you're going to see to it. Instead of the general, you know, we'll sing Anik Sotostamo, we don't sing that. We sing the vespers for the next day and the importance is on the Annunciation. And then, um, yeah, and then that's it. And then say March 25th. Yeah, March 25th on a Saturday. The Greek parade is March 26th. It's a Sunday right after. So should it either be really cold or mild oh, so rainy so let's be hopeful and that's it so thanks everyone have an excellent evening guys